Hello everyone, Kanasa here and welcome back to Coming Home Redux. In this episode, we are going to begin starting our first ever interplanetary colony. And I'm going to go to Hydrus because Hydrus, I haven't actually visited that with Kerbals yet. And it also happens to be the next planet on the transfer window list. So what we are going to be doing is creating a new class of interplanetary vessel in order to send a colony all over in one go. It is the Juna class. I did a bit of a short teaser for that a few days ago. So it has been teased, but we will be seeing that for the first time in this episode. However, it does require an awful lot of material kits to create one of these Juna class vessels. 300,000 nearly, which is quite frankly, a ridiculous amount of material kits. Luckily though, as we have set up before on Colin's base, no, Aldrin base even, on the surface of Armstrong, we are producing quite a lot of material kits. And in order to get those up to Colin Station, well, I am going to use USI's orbital logistics feature and apparently also blow up the entirety of Aldrin base whilst messing around with Kerbal Constructs. Not to worry though, I did do a bit of a quick save before attempting messing around with Kerbal Constructs and I was able to recover the base rather safely and put down a helipad exactly where I wanted to. And I have saved this now, so it will not disappear, which will be very nice. We've got a landing pad for the Mantas. Yes, rather than just landing on the rocks and throwing up dirt and getting all kinds of rubbish stuck in the wheels. No, we have somewhere nice to land. Anyway, you can see that I did send up a lot of material kits using that orbital logistics feature, and that has meant that we can produce the first ever Juna class interplanetary vessel. Now, obviously, this is the first of its kind, so this is going to be the RSAS Venus, the Road Space Alliance Ship Venus. Yes, that is the nomenclature for these vehicles, but we are going to be building a second one at a later point in this episode, and that does need a name. Now, I was thinking of calling these Phobos and Deimos originally. Obviously, Juna being the equivalent to Mars and Phobos and Deimos being the moons. As I was creating two of them, I thought that might be quite nice. But then I remembered I needed to name the first one the Juna. So we do need a name for the second one. So if you've got any recommendations, any suggestions for the second one of these that we will be building later on in this episode, please do leave those in a comment below. Anyway, what this first one is going to do is take over the crew and a metric ton of material kits and specialized parts. So in order to get the material kits up to here, I created another tiny little logistics add-on. Add yeah, a logistics add-on that we docked to this craft. And then that way I can do exactly what I did with the craft whilst I was building this craft. I can send up material kits from the surface of Armstrong at the click of a button. I don't have to worry about flying the missions myself. No, I can come down and just create these new transfers. And the first transfer, I'm going to send material kits. I'm also going to send specialized parts because we need those too. And we're also going to send enough monopropellant to fill the vessel, some fertilizer so that we can grow crops on the vessel for our Kerbals on their journey over to Hydrus and then the rest of it will just be filled up with lots of material kits. I think, no, I don't think, I know the amount of material kits that that vessel will be taking over to Hydrus for us will be 320,000. And it's going to take eight times four specialized parts, 32,000 specialized parts, which should hopefully be enough once we get over to Hydrus to build all of the miners that I'm going to require in order to set up a self-sufficient colony. I am going to be sending over the entire colony in one go, minus a nuclear production module, which we will have to build on site, but I'm not gonna be building the miners. I'm not gonna send the miners over. We are going to build those once we arrive at Hydrus. Then that way I can set up the base and then I can send those off at a later date. And also landing miners on an atmospheric planet, it's going to be a little bit janky. It's going to be a little bit tricky. So I'd rather build them on the ground and drop off those material kits and specialized parts in these pods 
and then send them off to their final destination rather than worrying about flying them through the atmosphere and figuring out how I'm going to provide a big enough heat shield to get one of those down. Although that being said, Hydrus really not traveling fast when you enter Hydrus's atmosphere and you slow down relatively okay, so you don't really need a heat shield. Anyway, we did fire up the Asimov on the RSAS Juna for the first time. <laughs> I've, I've said this name so many times already and I'm already forgetting it. But no, we are just going to put this into a bit of a high road orbit. And unfortunately for me, I was no longer able, no longer able even to physical time warp whilst burning with one of these because the part count just meant that that wasn't possible. So I went away and I downloaded a new mod. I went and got persistent thrust. Now this way, I can actually fire the engines whilst on, on rails time warp, which is going to be brilliant. It means I can time warp to like 100 times speed while still burning this engine. And the fact that these burns, well, I know the burns over to Hydrus, which I have already completed, but that won't be until the next episode. That took, I think, five hours for one of the Juna class vessels. So five hours of burning. I am very thankful that I can time warp through that because otherwise, well, these, these videos would have taken a lot longer to make. And already this video, I think the amount of footage that I got for this was probably about 24 hours or so. This one has been a lot longer. And obviously, this video is a bit longer than a normal coming home episode, at least in recent times. And one of the reasons why I've done this is obviously the views on these videos, they are going down a little bit. And I kind of wanted to maybe throw a spanner in the works, try and throw things up a little bit to see if maybe having a bit of a longer video kind of does a little bit better. But let me know once again in the comments what your thoughts are. Do you prefer the shorter style videos, the 12 minute style videos or this one, which I think is going to be 22 minutes or thereabouts. So a little while longer, more in what I was doing, more in keeping with what I was doing before, before I started doing the shorter videos. Yes, the, the before times. Anyway, yeah, but let me know what you think. Anyway, what I am doing now is obviously we have to refuel that vessel with liquid hydrogen. And I thought, well, we want to do it quite quickly. So let's see how much liquid hydrogen we can get up in one go. So I've decided to build a new launch vehicle and apparently I forgot to auto strut it. And that caused a rapid unplanned disassembly on the launch pad. Yes, no, that wasn't the best of starts for this launch vehicle, but we were able to get it off the ground. Now, this is a bit of a weird design. If I recall correctly, I believe the first stage uses liquid fuel and oxidizer. Actually, no, it uses vector engines. There is another launch vehicle that I've designed in this episode that will be coming up later that's a bit weirder. But we use a Methalox second stage. And this gets to orbit just fine. And now we're going to attempt to recover the booster. Now, the reason why I did design a new launch vehicle later on in this episode is this one didn't particularly go according to plan. I mean, it works and it's fine. It's just not as good as I would have liked it to have been. We could do a lot better. And we are attempting to land this, but unfortunately, those grid fins really don't slow us down all that quickly. And we did go crashing into the water. But when I did that, whilst I was filming this, for some reason, it swapped the craft as it crashed into the water. So I couldn't show that because it looked really janky and that was a bit unfortunate. But yes, no, we didn't recover that first stage, which was sad because it's always sad when that happens. It's, it's a great achievement when we do, but I, I feel like recently <laughs> we've been crashing more of them than, than we have been recovering, which is never good. Anyway, we did rendezvous with the Juna and I did actually dock that on a live stream, which is why I don't have the footage for it, which is also silly of me. I should have hidden my face whilst doing that live stream and just recorded that section. But anyway, we are going to be launching a second one of these now. This was a little bit of a redesign and apparently when I did redesign it, my staging was all messed up, which is why the first one of these had a little bit of an accident on the launch pad yet again. So really, the only thing that I've redesigned in this mission is that I have attempted to make the entire vessel reusable. 
except for the payload bearings. We're not going to be recovering those. But the first stage and the second stage, hopefully, should have enough about them to be reused once again. Unfortunately, the first stage ran out of fuel just before we hit the ground, so it exploded. But now what we're going to do is we are going to open up the inflatable heat shield, which we can see, and try and land this. However, we flipped around the wrong way, which didn't burn our vessel up. But once again, the grid fins were way too small to realistically slow us down where we could actually stop and perform a powered landing, which was a bit of a shame. Yes, the whole concept of this vehicle has a lot of work that I do need to do. And I'm not going to be redesigning that. I will be designing something new that we will see later on in this episode. Anyway, we did dock this to the Juna. I, I almost keep saying Venus or, or Eve because that's what the old ones were called. And we transferred over the last of the liquid hydrogen. And with two trips, that gives us almost 42,000 meters per second of delta V. So we are going to get these 10 Kerbals out. There's a lot of Kerbals to say in very quick succession, so I'm not going to list all of their names. And we are going to get them on board a Swordfish. Now, this is the new nuclear SSTO space plane that I've designed for this series. Once again, I did a bit of a short for this to tease this, and that was quite some time ago. This is the first time that we are going to be flying it for realsies in the series, though. And yes... This will be our passenger transport to get up to the Juna. And also, we are going to be sending this all the way over to Hydrus. Because I did a little bit of testing with this craft around Hydrus. And it is insanely good for flying around Hydrus. The KARE engines, the atomic ramjets that we have on the back of this. Well, they are great in atmosphere. Yes, I, I had to stop for the music there. They're, they're great in atmosphere because all they require is intake atmosphere and a bit of electric charge. This has a nuclear engine, not a nuclear engine, a nuclear facility, a nuclear power generator. That's the kind of word I'm looking for. A nuclear generator on it, powering it. So essentially, with Hydrus's atmosphere, that can fly indefinitely. With the amount of fuel that we have on that nuclear reactor, it could last us years. So it's going to be great for flying around Hydrus. And I did also test out the single stage to orbit capabilities at Hydrus, and it is fantastic. We only require about 400 meters per second of delta V using the liquid fuel on this to actually get to orbit, which is insane. It means that we're going to be able to do trips to and from the surface of Hydrus incredibly easily, which will be very nice considering we are setting up a colony on the surface. Anyway, we did dock the swordfish to the first of the Junas, and now this craft is ready to leave. In about a hundred days, yes. I probably should have sent the crew up later, but I was excited to get that swordfish all flown. Anyway, what we're going to be doing now is working on the second Duna class vessel. Now, this contains all of our colony modules that we are going to be setting down. It contains an entire colony in a box. But we are going to have to launch a rather large amount of material kits in order to build that. Because it has an entire colony contained within itself, we need almost 700,000. Which is quite a lot more than the original Juna class that we made earlier on in this episode. So we are going to be launching a new launch vehicle. Now this is the weird one that I was talking about. I got my launch vehicles messed up, silly Karnatsa. Yes, no, this has liquid hydrogen. It has Hydrolox for its first stage, which when you think about it, Hydrolox first stages are usually quite bizarre because they are lower, well, they tend to be lower thrust than say Kerolox or, or Methalox. But no, the engines that I use for the first stage of this, they, they definitely are Hydrolox because we can see the LH2 indicator on the left-hand side of the screen there. But they are the most powerful engines that I have. And this was a bit bizarre to me. Yes, no, I, I don't know why that is the case. It, it normally shouldn't be the case, but that's what we're going to use. They're very efficient and they're very powerful. And in order to launch 200 tons, I think this launch vehicle can take to low road orbit, or it might even be a little bit more. 
yes, we need very powerful engines. And a great thing about this launch vehicle, as we can see, this has returned to launch site capabilities. I was so close to landing on the landing pad there, but I missed it by mere meters, which was rather upsetting. So we sent the two side boosters back to the launch site, and the core booster, unfortunately, as we did just see, crashed into the sea. Because it was not very well designed, and that happened to be where we ended up landing it. And obviously, sea landings are never good for these. But we are going to be launching another one of these now. The first thing that we sent up was actually a liquid hydrogen tug that we are gonna put into low road orbit to begin with, to then send up these massive amounts of material kits, which we can see currently as the payload for this second rocket. Now, they have, if I recall correctly, about 200,000 material kits per launch. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to construct three of those in orbit, and then we are going to move that off and dock to the orbital dockyard alpha or trap the totally reliable assembly platform which is where we are building the new Juna class from. I almost once again landed on the launch pad there and I was so close that I thought you know what we're gonna try and move that try and actually get it on but unfortunately due to skill issue absolutely due to skill issue i was <laughs> i i crashed it into the ground okay it was nice and upright and then me being an idiot decided to move it and i broke it but we did manage to recover the core boost at that time which was more than nice and of course we got the payload up to orbit we got it over to that tug and we docked it and now we're just going to dock another two that i have launched as well there we go. This is the third and final one. I was originally going to create four of these, but I think three is going to be enough material kits to actually fully supply the totally reliable assembly platform and build up the new Juna class. The yet to be named Juna. Yes. Anyway, we are now burning for the station as we have got this entire thing constructed. And unfortunately, those annular trusses, when tweaked scaled down to a minuscule size, are not very good for holding on to 200 tons worth of material kits. And the entire thing got eaten up by the Kraken. Yes, the Kraken really did not enjoy that vessel in the slightest. And no matter what I did, I just could not make that work. So I went back and redesigned the payload. We're not going to send that rather janky looking vessel to dock with the totally reliable assembly platform. No, I just built a rather large of material kits on here instead. Dead. This is a lot more stable, but we are going to have to do several trips with this to actually get enough material kits to finalize the build. But there we go. We have now completed that, and in its excitement, the totally reliable assembly platform decided to throw away one of its fuel balls. I have no idea what happened there, but this surely was a taste of things to come. Because as we build the Juna, the second Juna class, well, it did not go very well, as we can see. And unfortunately, the entire thing rapidly, unplannedly, disassembledly in orbit. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that is a word, definitely. And unfortunately, no matter what I did, I could not get that to be built at the totally reliable assembly platform. I think it may be something to do with the fact that this ship is 740 parts and trap is 450. All of those parts together really was not very good. So in order to get around that, I did hyper edit one up into orbit. Now, I know it's kind of like, oh, it's cheaty. No, it's, it, I built it, okay? I set up all of the material kits and everything that I needed to build it in orbit. Just the game's limitations were preventing me from actually building that at trap, which is a bit sad. But anyway, I built it empty. So the new one is empty. And because of that, we are going to have to send over some resources. So I filled it up with liquid hydrogen and all of those resources that we can launch from road. However, it does require fission fragments in order to use the Asimov engine. And the place where we produce those is of course Collins Station. So I had to go and quickly design a small little vessel that could go from Collins Station all the way over to this vessel, which is in a low road orbit and transport all of its fission fragments. And there we go, we did just that. And now with that, we are able to start burning this. Now I am going to be doing a little bit of a spirally burn with this to begin with, to put it into a nice high road orbit. Like I did mention, the burns to get over to Hydrus are going to take about five hours. 
Now, if we were to do that in a low road orbit, well, we just would not be able to do that because we would be burning for longer than our orbit and it would be all kinds of janky. So in order to get around this, we are going to put it into a nice high orbit and then that way, when we actually burn, we'll have a lot more time to burn in the correct direction. But using persistent thrust once again, we are able to do this burn in the blink of an eye and put this to, I think, about 20 million meters or 20,000 kilometers above road. Now ready to begin its burn over to Hydrus. That's not the burn that we're doing right now. The burn we're doing right now is actually just to circularize it. But with this now in place and Baba Booey Kerman apparently on board the vessel, which he is not, once again, that's a weird bug from releasing things from Collins Station, don't know what's causing that. We are absolutely ready to send the two Juna class ships over to Hydrus to begin building our first ever interplanetary colony. But unfortunately, that will come in the next episode. I hope you have enjoyed this one. If you have, why not give it a like? If you've really enjoyed it and would like to keep up with the content on my channel, please do consider subscribing. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later.